I want to preach this morning from Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to preach on one pearl of great price. One pearl of great price. Um, you know, it's on another parable again, but Jesus speaks in many parables, and I think it's important that we understand what he is saying in all of them. So Matthew chapter, cha chapter 13 and verse 1, I'm going to skip through the chapter at times, so, um, but I'll let you know when we do that. So reading from verse thir chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that when he went into a ship and sorry, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables. And then let's skip down to uh, verse number 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall it be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whomsoever hath not, from him shall it be taken away, even he that hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand their, with their, their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are you, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many pre prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. And then verse 34 it says, And all things sp spake Jesus unto them in parables, and without a parable spake he not to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable. He answered and said unto them, and then he said another parable, and then skipping down to verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, when he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we glorify you and worship you and thank you and adore you. Lord, we just ask you, O oh Father, Lord, will you have your way in this gathering, O God. Lord, will you speak today, O God. Lord, will you help us see Christ, O Father. Lord, will you come down and move, O Father. Lord, we just worship and exalt you and adore you. Lord, I ask you, help this preacher to preach, O God, and help the congregation to hear, O God. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see this morning, O God. O Lord, let us not be those whose hearts have waxed gross, O Father. Lord, with abundance, O God. Lord, but let us, O Father. Lord, God, worship and adore you, O God, and see you, O God, and glorify you, O God. Lord, open up your parable here this morning to us. Give us the interpretation, O God. Lord, explain it to us, O God. Lord, deal with us, O God. Speak to our hearts, O God. Minister unto us, O God. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name. Amen. Sorry, Roy, would you just turn down number one on the thing a little bit? Yeah, it's a little bit epic, boomy. All right, thanks. <coughs> Amen. Amen. So... This parable, I'll read it again. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. In this chapter in Matthew, chapter 13, there are seven parables told. And in Jesus' whole ministry, he tells over 40 parables. So it's important that we understand why he tells them. And we touched on it when we were dealing with the, 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 the last things. We touched on why he tells them, but I want to look at it in a little bit greater detail because in this cha chapter, he gives probably the single best explanation as to why parables, why he speaks in parables and why he spoke 
only in parables, it says, to that multitudes. So it, he says, because they see not and hear not. This is a fulfillment from Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 10, where he says, Isaiah, it says in the book of Isaiah, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the hearts of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their heart see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So in the New Testament where Jesus says here, speaking about their hearts waxing gross, in Isaiah it speaks about their heart going fat or becoming fat. He says, the heart of the people is fat. The official description and definition of the word gross is not the Americanism that we have today where it's something that's uh, unsightly or disgusting, but in fact it's, it, it gives the impression of opulence. Overly fat, overly, uh, overly kind of a full of fat, opulent, kind of decrepit and decaying in a kind of a fatty sense. So he says this people's hearts made fat because of their sin, because of these Things. Their hearts have waxed gross, their ears have become heavy, their eyes have become sh shut. If someone's heart becomes fat, it's mean they've got too much. They have everything possible that they could possibly want, and yet their ears have become heavy. It's not, sorry, it's not yet their ears have become heavy, but because of this, their ears have become heavy and their eyes have become, and their eyes have become shut. It's the same issue in Isaiah's day that was in Jesus' day, yet there's a couple of hundred years of a chasm between the two of them. It is the same Jews, it is the same Pharisees, it is the same people groups, it's the same man, it's the same humans, it's the same human nature. We have the exact same thing in this hour. Do you know that it says, it says in uh, Ezekiel that the sin of Sodom was fullness of bread. That was one of their sins of Sodom. Fullness of bread. You think, oh, we're not like the Sodomites. Do you know what? There isn't great marauding homosexuals go roaming through the streets of Limerick, although sometimes there might be. But as a whole, there generally isn't most of the time. But fullness of bread, the same sins that we have nowadays. Like Brother Keith told us there, going into Christmas time, going into Christmas time, and it's just fullness of bread. You know, I spoke to a friend and I knew of a, uh, I knew of a lady who, uh, s who went into every single toy store up and down the length of the country stealing presents so that she could take a video of her kids on Christmas Day screaming their heads off. Saints of God, it's just a lesson in covetousness for our children. It's teaching them something that, they don't, that they'll carry into adulthood. You begin as you mean to go on. When those children start their lives, start in the way that you want them to be as adults. Fullness of bread was one of the sins of Sodom, and it's certainly a sin of today, and it was certainly a sin of those Pharisees. They would have looked at the Sodomites and thought, oh, those people are terrible, and yet it is the Pharisees, it, is the, it was the modern day Jews at the time, their hearts had become fat and had waxed gross. And so what, did, what effect did that have? Well, it meant their ears became heavy, and it means their eyes became sh shut. Well, what does it mean if your ears become heavy? It's not like you're an old man with big earlobes. Certainly not. It's that your ears have become heavy. They're closed. They do not hear the word of God, unwilling to hear the Jesus speaking to them, and their eyes have become shut. It's like seeing in front of them. You know, it says in Isaiah chapter 60 that those people groped for the walls as though they were blind. It didn't say that they were blind. It says they walked as though they weren't blind. Oftentimes we, it, it comes up in our lives, oh what should I do? And it's very, very clear and plain in the word of God. Very, very clear and plain in our own hearts and yet Jesus deals with us. These people, their ears had become heavy, their eyes had become shut and this is one of the reasons why Jesus told parables See, for those who were interested and close to Jesus, then everything was revealed to them. But for those who weren't interested in Jesus, nothing was revealed to them. And Jesus says this in verse uh, 12 here. He says, For whosoever hath to, sorry, for whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that that he hath. So basically what he's saying is, for those interested in Jesus and coming unto Jesus, everything's going to be revealed unto them. But for those not interested, everything's going to be taken away. So is it any wonder why the sinners in the street out there, your unsaved loved ones, do not care for Jesus? It's because Jesus is nothing to them. And so it is the, the value or beauty is in the eye of the beholder.
And so don't become despondent. These people's hearts have become fat and their ears have become heavy. They do not want to hear about a Jesus and yet we still must tell them about a Jesus. We have to tell them about the kingdom of God. We have to tell them about this one pearl of great price. And so again, why does he speak parables? Because certain people are going to get everything from this parable and certain people are going to get nothing. So it's going to be like water off a duck's back, going to go straight over their heads. They're going to think, what was that fella talking about? And have we not seen it in our own lives? You open up the Bible before you get saved and it's gobbledygook. It's like you're dyslexic and the words are everywhere on the page. But once you get born again or when the Lord decides to drop the veil from your eyes, it's amazing. It's life. And then, and then many of us like, uh, many of us like the naive children that we were in the Lord at the time would take that and go to people forgetting that their heart, that it's the heart of man or sorry, not knowing that it is the heart of man that shuts their eyes and ears uh, from wanting the Lord. You come with the Bible and you say, isn't this amazing? Because you saw how readily you accepted that truth, assuming they will accept the truth just as easily and readily. And then you get the shock of your life because to you, it makes the most sense in the world. You, know, you can read a parable at a pearl of great price. And I'm sure every single one of you who's born again will be able to preach a message on that parable. You can tell me that the pearl is the kingdom. The pearl is Jesus. And I've sold everything that I have. And I want to buy that pearl. But to some people, it makes no sense. They look at you and they say, hang on, you'd sell everything that you have for a pearl? What are you talking about? You open up the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And they say, are you a fool? And then you start thinking, maybe I am a fool. Well, we are fools. We're fools for Jesus Christ. It's because their hearts have waxed gross and fat. Ours have been given, we've been given new ones. They took away a heart of stone. The Lord took away our heart of stone and he gave us a heart of flesh. This is why he spoke to them in parables, so that to the people that he wanted to convey meaning to, he could reveal everything unto. And to the people that were not interested, they got exactly what they wanted. If they want to go to hell, they're going to go there. And they're going to go there by their own volition. It will be their decision where they go. But Jesus made these things very plain. And so, you know, oftentimes people say, nowadays we certainly see it, people say, oh, I'm a man of science. You know, I do not believe in emotive arguments. I just believe facts. Nobody, not, not Richard Hawkins, Dawkins, Watkins, anybody, none of these people care about truth. All they care about is their own worldview. They only care about their own decisions. People say, oh, evolution is a proven fact. It's absolutely not, and it's certainly not scientific. It cannot be proven scientifically. So what they take is a philosophical argument, and then they try to tell you that is a scientific argument, and us in this building believe them. And we can oftentimes be so foolish to think that they're right and then we get even worse if we want to take the extreme and say we don't believe in science saints of God we do believe in science combustion engines allowed all of you to get here kerosene was burned in the engines of Joshua's flight Boeing so that he could come to Ireland we are people of science we do believe in scientific method we don't believe in their philosophy there is a big difference we don't believe in the modern day religion that is science but we certainly do believe in science any of you women here, when you're washing dishes, you use hot water because it breaks down fat. That is science. We certainly believe in it. It's experiential. We see it every day. But what they believe out there, it's a religion. And, and they might say, oh, well, you're like our brother said, I, was, I spoke to a man this week. He was giving me the argument about COVID. What about your nana? And what about your grandmother? What about this? And this person fancies themselves a man of science. And I called them out in it. I said, hang on, that's an emotive argument. That is not based in science. And saints of God, oftentimes they'll come and try play on your emotions. They'll come say you're a fool. They say you believe in this babbling Jesus who only spoke in parables and analogies because to them it's nothing. But to you it's going to be everything. And to us it is the words of life. This is how you eat and drink of Jesus Christ. Reading his words, that is eating of Jesus. Drinking his blood, living out this life of redemption, of sanctification, of conformity to the image of Christ. Saints, these are the simple things of eating and drinking in Jesus Christ. And so this is why he spoke in parables. 
Now, who did he speak the parables to? Well, he spoke to the multitudes and the disciples in this particular chapter. Jesus spoke the exact same words to the multitude as he did to the disciples, but only one group was so desirous to understand, to, to, sorry, to understand what he meant to say. There was only one of these people groups that were interested in what he said. You see, this is the difference between the believer and the non-believer. The multitude will hear a parable, and if they don't understand, they'll just head on away and they'll forget, say, this fellow was a babbling idiot. But the disciples, if they don't understand, they want to know. They're going to come in, they'll humble themselves, and they might look foolish in front of their other disciple friends, and say, what did you mean by that parable exactly? Because they were going to strong arm their way into the kingdom of God, whether Jesus liked it or not. You know, the Bible says that the violent taketh by force, and that is heavenly etiquette. We go in there and we take something. Like, he, like Brother Keith says, you don't say, oh, can I tell you about Jesus? Like these Mormons. You go in and you just tell them about Jesus and of course we know we understand you can be polite there is under th there is being respectful even the Apostle Paul it says to men of repute he spoke to them in private you know we don't just take the heads off the prime ministers and governments and all those things especially not if you met them um, face to face these men are men of renown and respect and you treat them accordingly and speak to them respectfully but saints of God there is something real about taking those opportunities for the kingdom of God the kingdom of God God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. They have no problem causing violence to us and our kingdom and our belief systems. Let us go and rot violence and work. Not, if this is recorded, not physical violence, spiritual violence. We are not inciting hatred, YouTube. Please do not take this video down. Amen. Verse 36 says, Jesus sent the multitude away and then he went into the house. And the most damning indictment on these multitude is that they actually left. And so in this house, it's Jesus gives the interpretation of the parables to those who are listening. The disciples, they were the only people listening at this point. Can I tell you that there is a big difference between being the multitude and being a disciple? A very, very big difference. You know, they can all say that we all heard Jesus. Oh, we were all there at the beginning of his ministry. We heard him say the parable. But certain people left and went away and others came into the house with Jesus. The multitude are going to take every opportunity to leave the presence of Jesus and his saints. They're not going to go into the house with Jesus and they desire they desire to dwell in their own houses they're not interested enough in God's word to find out more and they will never be the ones saying declare unto us the parable They'll never be those people. You don't hear the multiple saying, you know, the only the saying, declare unto us the parable. The only time you read of crowds all speaking at once in the Bible is when they're saying, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. This is what the multitude band together and say. But the disciples, they come in, declare unto us the parable. We want to know. The word disciple means follower. And saints, as I've walked along this road uh, over my time, I have met people who have done their uttermost to elbow their way into the kingdom. And can I tell you, it's something beautiful to see. There's a man sitting in this congregation today, came over from Oklahoma City, said before he was ever really in touch with any of us that if this church is going to be your church, it's going to be your church. You're going to be up at four o'clock in the morning to be in the Sunday services, even though you're going to take your lunch time and you're going to be there in the Bible studies. You're you're going to do all of these things and it wasn't that my behest, Keith's behest, Hannah's behest, Jer's behest, anyone's behest, none of these things. He did it of his own volition. You see this man was coming in and he was making himself part of this church. Wasn't going to be offended if we weren't saying well done you got up in the morning at all hours and whatever of those things. He understand that we have, an op we have a responsibility here in this building and it's not only to him but it's to this city and all of the congregation. Saints of God that's heavenly etiquette. It. That's what the Bible does to someone. That's what disciples do. They follow Jesus into the house and they say, declare unto us the parable. Don't just re half sleepily read their Bible and say, oh, I don't understand what that means and then turn over and go to bed. No, they need to know. They want to know. They want to figure it out. It is not just for Brother Keith to determine what the Bible says, but it is for you to go and study. Maybe there's something you're going to teach that man someday. Maybe there's something Something that you're going to say to him that he has never ever considered because his brain does not function in that manner. We're all different, one body and many members. 
This is the difference between the multitude and between a disciple. You know, it says that Jesus sent them away. It says he sent the multitude away. What did they do? Just turned around and walked off. You need to look in the Bible how often Jesus tells somebody not to walk with him. How he says, how he tries to convince them that this is a difficult road and that if you continue after me, it's going to mean these things. You know, one fella says, I'll follow you to the ends, so I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. And he says, okay, that's fine, but I don't have anywhere to sleep tonight. And funny enough, we don't hear that man again. Or another guy says, let me first bury my father and then I'll come follow you. He says, let the dead bury their dead. We don't hear that man ever again. You know, we hear of the rich young ruler comes along and says, what can I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Sell all that you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. What does it say? He went away sad. Jesus wasn't begging anyone to follow him. Jesus was not begging anybody. And if your Christianity is determined by somebody in this building and not by Jesus Christ, then it is no Christianity at all. If you have to be begged to come into the house with Jesus, then best you go away with the multitude and go tend to your affairs at home. Let the, go bury your father. Go do whatever it is that you need to do outside because you're going to slow Jesus down. You're, we don't need people that don't want to be there. We want people that are on fire, that can stand on their own two feet, that can follow after Jesus and are desirous to know more of this Jesus, are desirous to be intimate with him. I desire is, you know, when I first met Hannah, I pestering her with texts and I used to well not pestering her but I used to send her uh, pestering is probably the wrong word but certainly sending her texts oh I love this song you know this is one of my favorite songs and you know anytime we would text she'd be like oh thank you very much brother God bless you and basically the way the, the text was written was like kind of we're done, we're done texting now, thank you. And I was like, okay, fine, uh, that's no problem, whatever. But you know what? I wasn't going to give up. I certainly wasn't going to give up. I'm not telling you that the Lord told me she was going to be my wife, far from it. But I loved her. I thought she was a nice lady. I thought she was godly. I saw she had paid a price to follow the Lord. And I thought if there was anyone I was going to want to uh, bear my children, it's this lady and someone I'd want to be married to. Waited so long, she comes in and you go after her. You know, if it's a case of just just, you know, one text and that was it, then, then, then fine. But see, it's the same with Jesus. We get born again and we want as much of Jesus yes. as we can possibly get. You read his Bible, you want more of it. You pray, you want more of it. You want to tell everyone about Jesus. You know, I remember when I first got saved, people telling me, uh, one guy exploded at me one day saying, you know that none of us believe this, right? You know, they were just, they were just so politely going along with my ramblings of the Lord and they just didn't want to kind of offend. But at one point he just had to much and he said you know that none of us believe this right and I thought yeah it's true but still I'm gonna keep going I can't stop the, it's the man I love this is the the man of Calvary who I fell in love with Joe you know, if Jesus tried to send me away I probably would have asked him Lord can I sit outside on the doorstep can I just see if I can press my ear up against the door with a glass up against it so I can hear you the woman whose son was sick he says oh sorry lady the bread is for the children she said but master even the crumb even the dogs eat the crumbs off the table. Even the dogs I eat the crumbs off the table. And saying to God, are you a dead lion here today or a living dog? Because I want to be a living dog before the presence of the Lord here today. I don't want to be a, a lion with all, a dead lion with all of his mane. Rigor mortis is set in but still looks perfectly beautiful like a nice little idol sitting over in the corner. Looks the part but means nothing. At least that dog, that dog's going to do something. And we love our Jesus. He sent the multitude away and they left. Yet the disciples are still there. They were waiting. They wanted to see what he had to say. So what is the parable? Well, the parable is one pearl of great price. And if you look up the pearl of great price, you're going to find a lot of silly Mormon literature because they've, they've robbed this term and they've named one of their books of doctrine, the pearl of great price. That is a pearl that should only be cast before swine. It means nothing. It is certainly not the Bible, but this is the real pearl of great price. It says in verse 45, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. So I want to look at, us, at this merchant man. What is the merchant man? Well, the merchant man, the word in Greek is emperor, and it means 
It means one on a journey, whether by sea or by land, especially for trade. A merchant as opposed to a retailer or a petty tradesman. So you wouldn't call somebody in a shop here a merchant. The merchant would be maybe the person who makes sure that that shop is stocked, transferring goods and services. You know, I was reading a sermon on this very topic by C.H. Spurgeon, and he says the laborer, the laborer works with the sweat of his brow, and the merchant works by the sweat of his brain. So that's a good way of thinking of it. The merchant man is always moving around. We have in Proverbs 31, a merchant ships are described. It speaks of that woman saying she is like the merchant ships and she bringeth her food from afar. So we have a description of what the ships that belong to the merchants are. They bring food from afar. They bring goods from afar. They bring commodities from afar. They're always toing and froing and this merchant is always trying to make his profit, his profit margins on it. So he is, he is a busy man. He's a man that's always moving. And most of all, he's unsettled. If he's going to be good at his job, he cannot ever settle. He needs to find out where his ships are. He needs to find out what they're doing, what ports they're going into. He needs to find out where the price of gold is cheapest at this very moment, where he can buy the cheapest wood, where he can buy the finest marble or stone, where he can get money so he can make edge and margin to sell on so that he can provide for himself the merchant man is unsettled the same as this woman this proverb she, she's busy you know oftentimes you, uh, I've, I've had so many or not certainly family members come and they're just poking and prodding so kind of aghast that Hannah will not go back to work but to say that she won't go back to work is a misnomer it's an oxymoron her real job starts now this is the promotion this is where her skills are best utilized and I've watched her and if the first eight days are anything for the next 80 years to go by then she's far better working for me and working for this child than she is working for Firecrest answering phones this is far more more valuable to both society and the kingdom of God and so the Proverbs 31 woman what is she like the merchant ships she bringing her food from afar she's checking oh duns have good avocados we'll go there little's ones are terrible don't get them there little's got good sourdough bread though and they've got tin tomatoes cheap we're gonna get those she's like the merchant ships bring it things from afar it's all logistics trying to order and 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 run that home the way she should be the Bible says that the woman is the keeper of the home the despoto of the home the despot of the home men husbands are you listening that's her territory you're the one who leads the house but she is the one who does all administrative and bureaucratic and orderly duties in that home and sometimes it is to let them do it because you know th this lady even even so far I thought I might have known a bit about taking care of kids because I mean both neither of us have really had any experience of it but there is something inherent biological and of her personality that is just far superior than I am and I'm willing to say that I'm certainly happy to do it God has ordered it for man and woman to come together not man and man not woman and woman we are to be complementary taken from the side of man always together one flesh come together and then birth forth children raise up godly seed and so that woman she's like a merchant woman and they often say you know a woman's job is never finished and there is there is a lot of truth in that you know them and uh, although I would agree that a man's job is never finished he's not to come home from work put his feet up on the couch and start you know drinking his smoothies you know we don't drink beer in here so whatever it might be it's none of those things because his role is just as important as high priest maybe he needs to start studying for the for the for the home Bible study for that week maybe he needs to be getting his scriptures together and so that he can teach his children and his family and his, his wife and all of those things he should always be moving but of the woman in particular there are always little things that always need to be done always so she, they're very rarely at rest Hannah's feeding that baby now regularly every two hours he needs to feed every two hours needs to feed he's going to be up maybe sometimes you might get four hours if you're lucky but it is it is ever moving and so here it is said that she is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar and yet this man in the parable is described as a merchant man so he is always ever moving very unsettled and there's nothing wrong with it because that's part of his job but saints of God can I tell you every single one of us before we came to the Lord was like that merchant man and if you are not founding your life on the Word of God even if you're in this very building 
building, you are like that merchant man, unsettled, always moving around like a rudderless ship. The merchant man is unsettled. He's without peace, always in competition with the world and her different circumstances. He's interested in the price of goods. He's interested in inflation. He's always interested in the risks that could be posed to his business. And it's the same as people out in that world in constant competition, keeping up with the Joneses, making sure Santa's got my kid all this and that and all those sorts of things. This is what people outside of Christ are like. They're like merchant men and women always going about, always toing and froing, never settled, always trying to figure things out and move around. And what's he looking for? He's looking for goodly pearls. And these aren't just any pearls. You know, these aren't just uh, insignificant things, but they are goodly pearls. Mary Mack, before she got saved, she thought when she was lighting those candles, going to mass services, that these were goodly pearls. Pearls that everybody could stand by and say, oh, that's a wonderful thing to do. See, this man, he's seeking goodly pearls but he's not finding the one that he's looking for. You see, out in that world, there are many, many goodly pearls. Oftentimes they show themselves in the forms of false religion, whether it be horoscopes, whether it be new ageism, whether it be uh, scientific philosophy. You know, it says in the book of Ecclesiastes uh, that uh, King Solomon tried everything. He said he first he tried women, tried mirth, which is folly or jokingness, maybe tried a stand-up comedy career, who knows? He tried so many different things. He had wealth for time he had absolutely everything that could be considered the best the cream of the crop of human experience and yet he said it all means nothing that man was in search of goodly pearls and if he couldn't find them what would make you think that you could find it if it's not Jesus Christ then it's not a real goodly pearl you know the world might consider these things to be goodly might think that's a wonderful thing oftentimes people say it when we get born again you tell them I got saved they say fair play to you it's the first thing that came out comes out of their mouth Fair pay to you. You see, to them, Jesus is a goodly pearl, just one of another. To them, Muhammad, a goodly pearl, just one of another. To them, repentance is a way that you can get your life together. It's a goodly pearl. But Jesus is not a goodly pearl. He is one pearl of great price. One pearl of great price. That's why we have singleness of focus. You know, people might say, oh, why can't you just do a little bit of this and a little bit of that? Why can't you come over here and do that? Saints of God, there is one pearl and it is of great price. You should not have the time to be able to dedicate to other things if this pearl has such a high price. If the, high pr if the value of this pearl requires your time, then that is the price that we must pay. If the value of this pearl requires your your homestead requires uh, all, the, all manners of things that we may put before the Lord, then that is the price that we must pay. This merchant man constantly seeking goodly pearls, and he wasn't able to find them. He was looking around all the time, unsettled, and we've seen him. People in here tried everything. My, own, my very own wife read the Quran in times past, looked for things, looked for things over here, over there. She's told me a story of when um, she was speaking to her dad before when she was uh, in her 20s, and she said, you know, what does it matter if I'm a manager of a shop or if I'm a prostitute? Who cares ultimately? And what she's asking is the great existential question, the meaning of life. What is value? What is important? You know, because there was pressure on her from family. Why don't you do something with yourself? She was off being a waitress and happy doing it. And that's a very, very reasonable question. What does it matter? Who cares? Well, you might say, oh, me and my mother love you and, and we want you not to do bad things. But hang on you're going to be dead someday and then that mean that it stops mattering saints of god if our lives aren't built on that built on that rock then all they are is goodly pearls all they are is meaningless goodly pearls they might appear to be valuable on the outside people might wear them around their neck as a badge of honor you know people walk around they'd love if their salary was printed on their forehead so that they might have some level of status on the streets goodly pearls worn very front and center so that everybody can see them but saints of god they're only goodly pearls pearls. They're not that one pearl of great price. Goodly pearls. What does it say afterwards? It says, when he hath found that one great pearl. 
You see, there is hope for this man. There is hope for this man who goes looking for these goodly pearls because this, this parable is told just after a previous parable. The previous parable speaks about a man that's found treasure in the land and so he goes away and he buys the field to look for that treasure. And so these are put next to each other. One man by happenstance stumbles upon Jesus and one man is seeking for something. He's looking for a city kind of like Abraham but without the faith. He's going around looking for something to fulfill him and to fulfill his desires and he finds it. He eventually finds it. So what happens? A sincere seeker will always find it. It says in Jer Jeremiah 29 and ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search with me with all of your heart. You know, this is, uh, I have the first Bible I was given by a friend of mine uh, when I first got saved has this very scripture. It was, I think, my favorite one at the time because it meant so much to me because I'd spent such a protracted and long time before coming to the Lord because of all sorts of different things and my own sin ultimately and a desire to not want to uh, buy that pearl effectively and, uh, and, and kind of asking the Lord, save me, save me, Lord, save me. But then the Lord re revealing to me that actually you don't really want to be saved. That's what was very clear to me at one point. And so then this scripture spoke to me. Ye shall search for me. Sorry. Ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Yeah. All. Not a little bit withheld. Not a small bit kept back. You know, the prayer, the prayer to God saying, Lord, I won't go drinking if the lads don't ask me to go. That's not a prayer that God's going to answer. You know, he's not going to put things in the way of those people. The devil's going to send them. They know, the devil knows that you're standing on very shaky ground with all of your heart. That's what it says. It says that we'll find him with all. And I realized that up until that point, I wasn't using all of my heart. But at the moment where I said, you know what, Lord, all of my heart everything. You're going to get all of it. That's when I got born again. That's when my life began to change. That's when things became to be very real for me. So this man, he's unsettled. He's always searching, searching for goodly pearls, probably finding them oftentimes, but knowing that they aren't it. And then eventually he finds it. He sees it. He witnesses it with his own eye. You see, this merchant man, it was do or die. He did not have the luxury of not finding pearls. It was his job. It was his vocation. This is what he did on a day-to-day -day basis and he wasn't going to be gi giving up you know too often people give up before they ever find that pearl you know oftentimes we've had people come into this church and the Lord might have, they won't be born again but the Lord might have given up uh, might have helped them to to be saved or, or, or sorry to be changed let's say and something might have changed in their life whether it be their lives have changed or relationships have been fixed and yet they go away they just go away and they're gone they don't come back because they found a goodly pearl that's all they did they didn't find Jesus Christ himself but for some people it's do or die they don't have that they don't have that uh, luxury they don't have the choice to just to come in here get a little bit cleaned up like a pig going back to the mire and go back they're at rock bottom and I, I thank God that it's all of us in here I thank God that all of us have reached that point I thank God that we've all come and realized there is no good in me and that in Jesus is all good and in him I thank God for that. You know, Jesus says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The multitude that Jesus turned away and the ones that were willing to leave left because they were not seeking for these goodly pearls. They just happened to be there. Thus, they would never, ever find them. Never going to find them. You know, people often say, I, I had a man, I had a man goading me saying, if you do this and you do that and you prepare this type of sermon and that type of sermon, then I'm going to listen to you. And you have to do it because you have the opportunity to save a soul. I thought... <laughs> I'm not the one who does the saving, my friend. <laughs> it's him. And you do not put quotation marks around save a soul. It's a weighty thing. And you're not going to do your little bunny ears when you stand before the Lord God Almighty. Play games with me? Fine. You're not going to play games with him. And it says the Pharisees often came to Jesus to tempt him. That's what they said. And so saints of God, there are these multitudes, these people, they all turn away. They weren't willing to knock. They just happened to be 
there. They were just interested. You know, it was entertainment for them. It is something to do of a Sunday morning, something to do in an afternoon. You know, back then they didn't have phones, no TVs. They hear a fella talking, so they're going to go away. And all he has to do is say, scram, and off they go. It's very simple for Jesus to, to, to shake out the chaff. Very, very simple. They didn't make it difficult for him. Saints of God, they were not seeking for goodly pearls. Very happy for their life. But there was a merchant man. There were merchant men and those disciples that were seeking for something more and they were not willing to relent and stop until they reached it, until they got there. So he found one pearl of great price. And I'm fin closing with this. This merchant man had finally had, had seen many pearls during his career. This was the one that he had seen day in, day out. He knew what a goodly pearl looked like and he knew what one pearl of great price looked like. There's a big difference. You see, he knew the difference. He was looking at pearls day in, day out. When someone does something every day, they get very, very familiar with it. You know, uh, uh, Sister Ellen here, she can teach, she does adult learning, adult teaching. She might be able to determine whether someone's better at reading English than I would be because this is what she does on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not something that I would be skilled at. This man was a merchant man. This man had seen every single goodly pearl that he could possibly have found and yet still hadn't find it but when he had seen it when he had seen this pearl of great price what did he do what did he do you see there is only one pearl it is one pearl of great price a singular pearl doesn't say that there was many doesn't say there was one in Southeast Asia one in Israel and one in the Americas it says there was one pearl of great price and Jesus Christ says on Jesus Christ said I am the way the truth and the life no man come to the Father but by me he is that one pearl of great price so why would we not have one point of focus in our lives why not would we not have such a narrow view of the world to solely purely only focus on Jesus because it's worth it saints of God it's going to give you a far better return than any goodly pearl you could possibly uh, you could possibly endure and we are supposed to uh, put our he put our treasures in heaven and not on earth because someday on earth they're all going to be going to be gone it's going to be disappear but this man knew what he was buying and we want to be like these merchant men when he had found the pearl of great price what did he do it says that he sold all that he had and he bought it so what's the first thing he did the first thing that this man did is he was looking for a pearl so he had this unsettled man and he's looking that's what it says it says that the kingdom is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls so what's the first thing he seeks goodly pearls and then what's the next thing he finds a goodly pearl and what does he do then does he go home does he brilliant I found that goodly pearl now off I go see you later I found a goodly pearl that pearl is always going to be there when I want to come back when I do I'm a bit too young to be buying the goodly pearl now so I'll do it when I get older or perhaps better yet I'll wait till I'm on my deathbed and then I'll buy I'll call that trader who had that goodly pearl I'm going to get him in here I'm going to buy it and then I'm going to leave it to my family whether they be foolish or whether they be wise I'm going to wait till I get my deathbed deathbed no, he didn't do that. And saints, we've all heard people say that to us. We have all heard people say to us that, oh, I'm too young now. You know, I believe what it says, but uh, when I'm older, you know, when I'm older, I can do that. Older may never come, first of all. And the same rotten heart is only going to be more rotten with years of rottenness and decay having set in. Now is the time. Now is the day. Today is the day of salvation. And that should put an urgency within us. These people do not seek goodly pearls. So what did this man do when he, when, he found, when he found it? It says that he sold all that he had and he bought it. He sold all that he had and he bought it. Saints of God, it is not good enough that we have Jesus in a book or have Jesus in the place of prayer and knowing it's there like something on a shelf. Do you know that it says in, uh, it says in the Old Testament, I think it's in Ezekiel, and God condemns the people of Israel and says, you play me like an instrument. You take me off of the shelf when you want and you use me for entertainment. And sadly, 
the church can become entertainment. I am entertained by coming to the house of God. I love coming to the house of God. Brother Keith exhorting us this morning. I find it entertaining. I enjoy it. I, 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 it is life to me. I don't come here by drudgery, but it's a different kettle of fish when it's like a, when it's like just something that you can just take down. It's just like a play thing. You know, our brother and sister got a puppy recently, and they're not just going to keep it till Christmas and then get rid of it. You know, they're not just going to enjoy it and give it cuddles and fire it out the back that for whenever they don't want it. No, there is a, a responsibility to that puppy. There is a responsibility to Jesus Christ, can I tell you that? And you know, it's a terrible thing when that is almost a... When that is almost a strong statement, you know, Jesus said far stronger things than there's a responsibility to him. What he said, and our brother read it this morning, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise up, raise up to him the last day. There is a responsibility. It says in Proverbs, buy the truth and sell it not. So that means you can sell it. It means you can actually sell it. Just because you're in here doesn't mean you're safe and sound. And I don't believe that anybody can take your salvation away from you. But I can tell you that it is possible for you to neglect it. Absolutely. If it's possible for me to neglect a child, how much more possible to neglect God? Why is it that in every facet of our lives we could show neglect to something and yet with the Lord, no, we can't. It's just all Him. Did He not say that we are to take up our cross daily? Did He not say that if we do not take up our cross and follow Him, we're not worthy to be His disciples? That's a much stronger statement than saying we have a responsibility to Him. And I'm just saying we have a, a great responsibility to Him. Jesus says in Matthew 16 that if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what man, so for what is it a man, pro, sorry, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Saints of God, when this merchant man found that one pearl of great price, he sold everything that he had and he bought it. You see, you have to, selling all that you have isn't enough. You know, maybe there was a time when if he sold all that he had and he was going down to buy that pearl, he might have thought, are oh, you a bit of a fool? Maybe you should, maybe you should buy the second best pearl. But saints of God, there is no second best pearl. There's either goodly pearls or that one pearl. And saints, that's why we must have that singleness of heart, that singleness of focus. There is purely one pearl, one baptism, one life, one word of God, one God, one Jesus, one thing. This should be the defining marker of all of our lives. You know, very early on in my Christian walk, I realized that you will know them by their Facebook. Do you know, that's what, it's not what Jesus said, but that's certainly, people, people often say, you know, I, I've, I've met men, they say, oh, that person's a Christian. Yeah, no problem, I'll just have a quick look at his Facebook. And, uh, and I've met Christians where I knew that they were Manchester United fans, or I've known that they were uh, artists, or I've known that they enjoy watching Star Wars, but I couldn't tell you f if I looked, and I did, I tried, that they were a Christian from their Facebook page. You see, we should have one singleness of focus. Saints, I have many different interests, loads. There are so many things that interest me, and I think some of them are very important, but there's only certain things that I propagate in this life. You know, there was a time in my life where I was trying to get very heavily involved in politics because it so interested me, fascinated me. At that time, that was in my life, but, but there, and, and I believe that Christians can be politicians. You'd have a hard time teaching out of the Bible that they can't be because many of the good men of God, they were, they had political, they were political appointees. They were politicians in the land where they either civil servants or prime ministers or kings or monarchs, whatever it might be, they're there. The great man of God, Ian Paisley, he was both a politician and he was a preacher of the gospel. It is possible, but saints, it was not for me. Because there was a church here that needed preachers. You know, 
let the world have their politicians. Now, I'm not suggesting that they can't. There's places in America that's overflowing with Christians. Well, then there you go. There is an overflow. But what Limerick City needs is not more politicians, but hellfire preachers. You know, I remember one day we were on the street distributing uh, the literature for, for, for the party that I was a member of, distributing it. And first of all, I thought I should be distributing tracts. I thought this is a terrible thing. And it got even worse when the Lord sent a homeless man to speak to me and basically said, what are you going to do for me? And I thought, this party can do nothing for you, my friend. But Jesus can. Yeah. Jesus can. Politics are going to be nothing. We had homeless men on these streets say to us, uh, you say to us, oh, will Jesus put a, head, a roof over my head? And I, and I thought, how dare you goad the Lord in such a manner? But yes, he would if you repented. Jesus says he would. And you can say that with honesty because the reason that those people aren't homeless is not happenstance. You know, they say there's a homeless crisis and there is a homelessness crisis. But Ian and Eve are sitting there with the keys to two homes in their pockets tonight. Okay, they didn't go a night homeless at all because the Lord provide. God himself will provide. And Jesus says that think of the grass of the field. They're clothed finer than Solomon and God looks after them. Think of the birds of the air. They do not. They, they, they go toing and froing and God feeds them themselves. He says, what do you need to worry about? The kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. There's no homelessness crisis in the kingdom of God. There's no homelessness crisis in here. God will provide himself. Seek ye first that one, goodly, that one pearl of great price. And I'm telling you, you will not go hungry. I'm telling you, you won't. You know, this merchant man's wife might have come to him and said, what do you think you're doing? You've sold everything we have. We don't even have a grain of rice to eat tonight. And he says, I have to buy that pearl. I have to buy that pearl. This is life and death. The, the, the Christian comes to a point in their life where they can't, do anything but, because if they do not buy that pearl, it's death. It means absolute death to them. And so you basically don't have a choice. That's how I felt when I first got saved, is that I was posed with two choices and it was a non-choice. One was the world, drug addiction and depression, or the other was the Lord, life and life more abundantly. That is a non-choice. That is a non-choice. And it's a non-choice because of the work that the Lord did in my heart. Saints of God, we must buy this pearl. If we find this pearl, we must sell all that we have and buy it. The Apostle Paul says that he counts all things dung, that he might win Christ. The Bible says that uh, the, the, to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Saints of God, whatever it is that the Lord wants you to give up to follow after him, it is a, but a small price. It means absolutely nothing. Saints of God, the book of Proverbs says, buy the truth and sell it not. But can I leave you with this? How about we sell the lie and buy the truth? Amen. Father, Lord, we worship you, O God. And thank you, O God. We praise you and glorify you, O God. We thank you for that one pearl of great price, O God. We thank you that there is not many, O God. Lord, we thank you, O Father, Lord, that you are a single God, O Father. We praise you, O God, Lord, that you look after us, O God. Lord God, that you cover us, O God, by your precious blood. We thank you that you've provided us the means to buy that pearl, O God. We thank you, O God, Lord, that you have provided us the desire to buy that pearl, O God. We thank you, O God, Lord, that we were once unsettled merchant men, O oh God, toing and froing, O oh God, depressed, O oh God. Lord, without, Lord, natural affection, O oh God, and let your, you saved us, O oh God, and changed us. O oh Father, Lord, we praise you, O oh God. Lord, that you did such a mighty work in our lives, O oh God. Lord, that you glorified yourself within us, O oh God. Lord, that you changed our hearts, O oh God. And Lord, that you showed us that that pearl was of value, O oh God. Lord, that you showed us that your kingdom was of value, O oh God. Lord, that your kingdom of heaven is greater than anything this world can ever offer, O oh Father. Lord God, I thank you that we can sing, O oh God. Lord, that we'll serve no other God or any other treasure. Lord, we worship and exalt you. We praise you and glorify you. We we thank you in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name.